Chapter Ten of All in the Day's Work by Ida Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Rediscovering My Country. The four years I put in on the life of Abraham Lincoln did more than provide me with a continuing interest. They aroused my flagging sense that I had a country, that its problems were my problems. This sense had been strong in my years on the Chautauquan, but the period following had dimmed it now i was beginning to ask myself why we had gone the way we had since the civil war was there not enough of suffering and of nobility in that calamity to quiet the greed and ambitions of men to soften their hates to arouse in them the will to follow lincoln's last counsels with malice toward none with charity for all let us do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations but greed and hate and indifference to the suffering and rights of others had been rampant since the war did war as a method of righting wrongs so loosen the controls which man in times of peace establishes over himself that he is incapable of exercising the charity the peaceful adjustments for which lincoln called was there always after war an unescapable crop of corruption a thirst to punish and humiliate and exploit the conquered must men go back where they had started go back with controls weakened and burdened with a load of new and unexpected problems true this war had ended slavery as a recognized institution given the black man legal freedom but how about opportunity discipline for freedom and then again was a war necessary to destroy slavery was it not already doomed lincoln thought so doomed because it was showing itself unsound economically as well as because it outraged man's sense of justice and humanity and how about the effect of this war on democracy were the problems it loosed less threatening to democratic ideals than slavery had been were they not possibly a more subtle form of slavery more dangerous because less obvious a nice box of problems to tease me as i worked on lincoln's life and out of the corner of the eye watched what was going on in the country the number of things in america i was beginning to want to find out about was certainly dimming the things in france i had wanted to find out about unquestionably these new interests were helping to wean me from the plan on which i had settled the process was painful more than once i told myself that the sacrifice of my ambitions of my love for paris for my friends there was too much to ask of myself i could never replace those interests and associations but i was replacing them and suffering as i realized what was happening revolting that nothing in my life seemed to last to be carried through by nature i was faithful to give my time to new friends neglect old ones in spite of never forgetting them as i never did was disloyal i was beginning to repeat dolefully as well as more and more cynically tu las tu cas tu pas washington was helping in my weaning the city as i knew it in the eighteen nineties is lost in the washington of the nineteen thirties the pivots on which it swings the capitol the white house were there then to be sure so was the washington monument but they stood by themselves the nearby flanking unpretentious often squalid today they are almost lost in the piles of marble heaped about them to accommodate the ambitions and creations of the last frantic twenty years the town has stretched unbelievably to the northwest where once i knew wide lawns wooded tracts pleasant walks are now acres upon acres of apartment houses and hotels they have engulfed the delightful woodley lane where my friends the hubbards lived in summer and they have changed no less the quarter in which their fine town house stood connecticut avenue where it merges into dupont circle great houses were only just beginning then to find their way into the circle george westinghouse had built there so had mrs leiter of chicago old washingtonians sniffed at their houses and their ways laughed at mrs leiter's spinal staircase as she was said to call it and professed disgust at mrs westinghouse's reported white velvet tablecloths 
they resented the invasion of rich women attracted by the social possibilities of a diplomatic circle of rich men attracted by the field for lobbying furnished by a congressional circle but of this side of washington i saw nothing my social life was shaped largely by the continued kindness of mr and mrs hubbard i had become almost one of the family was freely invited to meet their friends their circle was wide including diplomats and statesmen and eminent visitors though its core was the large group of distinguished scientists which made up the working forces of the smithsonian institution the agriculture department the geological survey the bureau of mines the observatory an important group they were and nobody in town appreciated them more or took more pains to show his appreciation than mr hubbard naturally the centre of this group was alexander graham bell married to the hubbard's daughter mabel the bells lived across the avenue from the hubbards and i soon had the good fortune to be welcomed there a great privilege for both mr and mrs bell were rare persons mrs bell's story is well known but it was only in seeing her with her husband and daughters that one could realize what a fine intellect and what an unspoiled and courageous character she had she had been deaf and dumb from infancy and mr hubbard had determined to open life to her among the teachers of speech he brought to her was a young man then at boston university alexander graham bell under his tutelage she made rapid strides and the two young people learned to love one another at that time mr bell was giving his nights to trying to make iron talk i once heard mr hubbard say that when he found mr bell had made iron talk he told him he must develop his telephone to a practical point or he could not have mabel probably no other argument would have persuaded alexander graham bell for he was the type of inventor whose interest flags when he has solved his problem let somebody else take care of the development he would be off on a new voyage of discovery at the time i came into the circle mr bell was i think the handsomest and certainly the most striking figure in washington it was amusing to hear people discussing who was the handsomest man in town there were various candidates general miles general greeley colonel john foster but while i conceded they all had their points no one of them had the distinction of alexander graham bell and no one of them certainly had the gay boyish appetite for what he found good in life he was more like massa henry waterston in that than anybody else i have ever known though the activities and interests of the two were utterly different mr bell's plan of living was modelled to suit himself often he slept through the day when interruptions naturally came and the telephone most often rang if restless at night he played the piano mrs bell could not hear and the rest of the family being young and devoted were never disturbed he was up and began his day around four to six often there were guests for dinner for everybody of note the world over who came to washington wanted to meet him on wednesdays after dinner there usually gathered a group of scientists and public men to talk things over mr bell was something to see at these dinners and gatherings the finest social impresario i ever saw in action so welcoming appreciative eager receptive i thought then i had never seen anybody so generous about what others were doing he loved to draw out great stories of adventure and discovery and would silence all talkers when once such narrating was started partly this was because of mrs bell his intense desire that she enjoy everything that was going on and she did thanks to the intelligent devotion of her daughters elsie and marion the first now the wife of gilbert grosvenor one of the founders and the present editor of the national geographic magazine the second the wife of david fairchild botanist and explorer the organizer in the agriculture department of the work now known as the division of foreign plant exploration and introduction two men to whom the public owes big debts for services the most distinguished member of this washington group of scientists after mr bell was professor samuel pierpont langley the head of the smithsonian institution at that time agonizing over the problem of flying 
when i first met dr langley in 1894 he was working on his air runner or aerodrome a machine which as i gathered from the talk i heard and did not too well understand was to run on the air as an engine does on rails he finally came out with a machine weighing about twenty-five pounds made up of a pair of rigid wings twelve to fifteen feet across and an engine which weighed not over seven pounds it had cost him four years work to develop the engine to that lightness but would it fly could it be launched attempts were made from a houseboat down the river these experiments were carried on with the utmost secrecy for dr langley was a taciturn man proud dignified always awesome to me he knew that there was a public that thought him a little touched in the head and wondered that the government kept as director of a great national institution a man who held the crazy notion that one day people would fly and who was willing to give his days and nights to proving it dr bell took the most genuine and enthusiastic interest in dr langley's experiments was always present i think when an attempt to launch the air runner was made i recall his disappointment when it fell his rejoicing when it did finally fly this was one day in may of eighteen ninety six i have heard him tell how suddenly the air runner rose to one hundred feet and flew in a big circle it did not fall but made a perfect landing again it was launched and again it flew and this time it went over the land and over the treetops came back to the river and when its power was exhausted settled quietly on the water inside that little circle at dr bell's there was the consciousness of a great discovery a certain solemnity that again it had been proved that labor training thought patience faith are not in vain mr mcclure was as excited as any one of the washington group over the news he must immediately have an article from dr langley himself and i was commissioned to get it i think perhaps it was a little strain on dr langley's good will to have a young woman come to him and say now we want the whole story of how you have done this thing what it means but no scientific jargon please we want it told in language so simple that i can understand it for if i can understand it all the world can which knowing me he probably knew was true he consented and i had the privilege of talking with him occasionally about the article of reading what he did and saying when necessary i don't quite see what this or that means of seeing him docilely make it clear enough for me to understand a year after the langley contraption first flew we had in mcclure's magazine the whole story as a reward for my persistent effort to see that article come out to his satisfaction he gave me what i think he considered the greatest treat he could give his friends he took me to the rock creek zoo after the crowds had gone and with the help of the director dr baker made the kangaroo jump and the hyena laugh but the public interest in his air runner the fresh honors that now came to him did but little to wipe out the bitterness that ridicule had stirred in dr langley there was a time he said as he was going to england to take a degree which oxford university i believe it was was giving him there was a time when i should have been glad of this it means little now yet he had his moments of strong emotion rarely have i been more moved than at a dinner at mr hubbard's soon after the greco-turkish war began in eighteen ninety seven a half-dozen men of seventy or thereabouts were at the table among them senator hoare of massachusetts major powell edward everett hale and dr langley they talked only of greece and her helplessness before the turk they recalled the wave of sympathy which in their boyhood had swept over the country when the turk attacked greece it was to greece said senator hoar that he first gave money of his own a long treasured twenty-five cent piece dr hale and dr langley fell to quoting byron their voices shook as they declaimed the isles of greece the isles of greece earth render back from out thy breast a remnant of our spartan dead of the three hundred grant but three to make a new thermopylae 
it was byron said dr langley with an emotion of which i had thought him incapable who first stirred in me an enthusiasm for man's struggles for freedom with a desire to join those who fight for it he thought byron first opened england's eyes to her duty to the oppressed of the continent of europe and at the same time opened the eyes of the continent to the love of liberty the sympathy with the helpless in english literature certainly here was a dr langley i had never before glimpsed this was not all of washington i was seeing as in paris i set aside time for learning the city how thin and young and awkward washington seemed compared with the exhaustless life and treasures of paris here was none of that wisdom of experience that subtle cynicism that pity and patience with men which made paris like a great human being to me nor was there here the ripe charm of old palaces quaint streets hidden corners everything was new sprawling in the open but if washington had little to offer but promise it had that in abundance and it did not know its own lacks it was too full of pride in what it had done since john adams moved into the white house and congress into the capitol and then i had a problem to think about the washington lincoln knew and i went about with him from white house to war department up to the congress down to the arsenal into this and that hospital up to the soldiers home over to arlington the pain and tragedy behind almost every step he took in the town dignified its unfinished streets gave a meaning and a sanctity to its rawness by such steps i told myself did paris come through the centuries to be what she is but i did more than follow lincoln about i wanted to know the washington of thirty years after lincoln and so i went to the capitol when debates promised excitement and i missed no great official show when mckinley's inauguration came in eighteen ninety six i arranged to see it all once i told myself will do forever for an inauguration as it has done i began after breakfast and did not stop until the inaugural ball was far on its way a fine colorful sight-seeing experience leaving a series of pictures which have never quite faded years later one of these pictures brought me a curious bit of minor political history i was trying to persuade richard olney to write the story of the venezuela message for mcclure's and remarked that the first time i met him was at the mckinley inaugural ball to my surprise he flushed outgoing cabinet members are not expected to attend the inaugural ball of a new president he said i hadn't known that or of course i should not have spoken but there was a reason for my presence general miles then head of the army had come to me to say that there were rumors of an attempt on mckinley's life suppose that both he and hobart should be assassinated before a new cabinet is appointed he said you would be acting president you must go to the ball walk with mrs mckinley and stay until the end i didn't like the idea but general miles insisted so i went but the new president walked with his wife and i had to hang around conscious that more than one republican was saying what's olney doing here what was behind general miles precaution i never knew the lives of presidents are always in danger even in what we are pleased to call normal times there always being plenty of grievances real and fancied to be squared at the moment of the mckinley inauguration the despair and bitterness of many radicals over the defeat of bryan were outspoken the experience of the country with assassination in the thirty preceding years had been alarming a man in general miles position charged with the safety of the heads of the government must keep in mind all possibilities it would of course have been easy to assassinate the president and vice-president at the ball given clever and determined conspirators there would have been a chance to seize the government while a new president was being elected but with a determined man like Olney on the ground, backed by a watchful and sufficient military guard scattered through the great patent office, where the ball was held, a temporary government could have been formed while the murderer was being manacled. How General Miles would have enjoyed such a coup, 
in the first years of mckinley's administration i came to know him well another one of the friendly acquaintances made in carrying out the varied tasks that came my way in my position as a contributing editor of mcclure's magazine for several years popular interest in military affairs had been growing there were several reasons doubt of the efficiency of our army talk of revolution and particularly our strained relations with spain interest was still further excited in eighteen ninety six by the outbreak of the greco-turkish war which starting as a skirmish soon grew until it looked as if it might involve all southeastern europe perhaps england russia obviously we should have an observer over there and so in may general miles and a staff started for the field he studied the military organization of turkey and of greece watched the armies lined up for battle saw the end of the war from greece he and his staff went to london to represent the united states at queen victoria's jubilee following that great show he attended the autumn maneuvers of the greatest of then existing armies those of russia germany and france mr mcclure thought there was an important story in general miles observations and i was commissioned to get it but general miles willing and glad as he was to tell of his european experiences he had never been abroad before wanted to tell only of the sights he had seen sights which had nothing to do with armies their equipment and their manoeuvres all that was shop for him thou think i didn't see anything but soldiers and guns he growled that i'm not interested in history and art people don't know how wonderful pompeii is and i would like to tell them a lot of them never heard of alexander's sarcophagus finest thing i ever saw there are countries that would pay a million dollars to get it and there's the parthenon and moscow and the tower of london and the louvre these are the things i want to write about and he was preparing to do it as i saw by the stack of baedekers the volumes of the britannica the pamphlets and travel books on his desk it took all my tact and patience to persuade the general that whatever his interest ours was centered only on military europe in the course of this distasteful task i came to have a real liking for general miles he was as kindly and courteous a gentleman as i have ever known and certainly the vainest one of the real disappointments of his european visit was that the american uniform was so severe there were hundreds of lesser ranks than himself on parade with three times the gold braid he was allowed when it came to the queen's jubilee he revolted and had special epaulets designed i was at headquarters the day they arrived from london and nothing would do but i must see them he ordered the box opened disappeared into an inner office and came back arrayed in all the glory the american army allowed him i was working on the miles articles on february sixteenth eighteen ninety eight when the main blew up in havana harbor as no message came cancelling my appointment with general miles that morning i presented myself as usual though with some misgiving for it seemed as if the very air of washington stood still at headquarters there was a hush on everything but the routine went on as usual as we worked an orderly would come in with the latest report two hundred fifty three unaccounted for two officers missing ship in six fathoms of water only her mast visible sir then a second report all but four officers gone sir and there are two hundred women up in the navy department the army and the navy were in the same building in eighteen ninety eight the general made no comment but every now and then blew his nose violently while his smart chief of staff a gallant simple-minded officer with a bullet hole in his cheek kept saying to himself ain't it a pity by jove ain't it a pity through the two months between the blowing up of the main and the declaration of war i vacillated between hope that the president would succeed in preventing a war and fear that the savage cries coming from the hill would be too much for him as they were in the end i honestly believed then as i do now that he was doing his best and this in spite of the fact that my heart was hot with resentment for what i considered his cowardly desertion of my poland friends in eighteen ninety three mckinley was patient collected 
surprisingly determined everybody indeed in the departments where the brunt must fall if war came seemed steady to me as i watched things in my frequent visits to general miles headquarters everybody was at his post everybody except theodore roosevelt assistant secretary of the navy he tore up and down the wide marble halls of the war and navy building like a boy on roller skates a disgusted observer growled more than once he burst into general miles office with an excited question an excited counsel already he was busy preparing his rough riders for the war to be if he had his way already he saw himself an important unit in an invading army i remember this because it shocked me more than anything else i was noting what chance had government in peace or war if men did not stay on their jobs was not fidelity to the trust committed to you a first obligation and if theodore roosevelt felt as he evidently did that he was needed in the army did not good manners if nothing else require resignation i was very severe on him in eighteen ninety seven the more so because he had bitterly disappointed me in eighteen eighty four when he had refused to go along with the mugwumps in the revolt against prohibitive protection refused and gone along with my particular political abomination henry cabot lodge i had not been able to reconcile myself to him even when as a police commissioner of new york city he made his hearty and effective fight on the town's corruption the steadiness of general miles and his staff in the weeks between the blowing up of the main and the breaking out of war with spain raised my respect for army training as much as roosevelt's excited goings-on antagonized me at the same time my contempt for the outpouring of congress in a crisis was modified by almost daily association with one of its oldest members the senator from massachusetts george frisbee hoar when i had decided in eighteen ninety four that sufficient materials were at hand in washington for the sketch mcclure's wanted to go with gardner hubbard's napoleon portraits i went to live at a boarding-house on i street between ninth and tenth recommended by mrs hubbard chiefly because senator and mrs hoare lived there the neighborhood had been not so long before one of the desirable residential sections of the town but business and fashion were pushing well-to-do residents into connecticut and massachusetts avenues into dupont circle and beyond the fine old brownstone houses left behind were being used by trade and occasionally by owners whose incomes had been cut or destroyed as rooming or boarding houses the head of the house into which i was received was a mrs patterson the widow of a once distinguished washington physician she and her daughter elizabeth made of their home one of the most comfortable and delightful living places into which i had ever dropped such food and best of all the senator at this time senator hoar was close to seventy years of age he had been in congress for twenty-six consecutive years seventeen of them in the senate and everybody knew that as long as he lived massachusetts republicans would insist on returning him he embodied all the virtues of the classic new englander and few of the vices his loyalty was granite ribbed he revered the constitution and all the institutions born and reared under it he was proud of the united states but his heart belonged to massachusetts in his mouth the name took on a beauty and an emotion which never ceased to stir me westerner than i was combined with his patriotic loyalties was a passionate devotion to classic literature greek roman english he knew yards of homer and virgil as well as of the greatest of the early english writers and not infrequently at our sunday morning breakfasts he would repeat long passages in his sonorous voice this was the one hour in the week when the senator laid aside all formality and became our entertainer he never spoiled things by opinions on current events but poured forth daily whatever came into his mind we were a good audience willing to sit until noon if he would talk he claimed that it was mrs patterson's codfish balls and coffee that put to flight all his cares and loosened his tongue that patterson's sunday morning breakfast was enough to put gaiety into any heart 
senator hoar had already celebrated it in a widely circulated letter to a pennsylvania editor who attacked him for never having done a stroke of useful work in his life and what greatly amused the senator living in washington on champagne and terrapin my dear man he wrote the irate critic your terrapin is all in my eye very little in my mouth the chief carnal luxury of my life is in breakfasting every sunday morning with an orthodox friend a lady who has a rare gift for making fish balls and coffee you unfortunate and benighted pennsylvanians can never know the exquisite flavor of the codfish salted made into balls and eaten on a sunday morning by a person whose theology is sound and who believes in all the five points of calvinism i am myself but an unworthy heretic but i am of puritan stock of the seventh generation and there is vouchsafed to me also some share of that ecstasy and a dim glimpse of that beatific vision be assured my benighted pennsylvania friend that in that hour when the week begins all the terrapin of philadelphia or baltimore and all the soft-shelled crabs of the atlantic shore might pull at my trouser legs and thrust themselves on my notice in vain as we all knew senator hoar had no money for champagne and terrapin he had sacrificed his law practice to public service getting a little poorer year by year as a matter of fact he had no interest in making money i never saw him more irritated than after taking a difficult case for which he was to get a fee of twenty five thousand or thirty thousand dollars earning money is hateful to me he said never in all my life before have i undertaken a thing i did not want to do simply for money some things i like to do believe that i can do better than i could do anything else i never was such a donkey before there are so many things i long to do one of them is to learn italian well enough to read dante and boccaccio and ariosto in the original and i want to commit homer to memory i would like to have my head packed with greek the senator's sunday morning talks were rich with anecdotes of new england types he had his antipathies margaret fuller osoli was one of them he used to tell the story of an old conquered doctor who was called up in the night by a quavering voice outside his window asking doctor how much camphor can a body drink without its killing him who drunk it he asked margaret fuller a peck snapped the doctor shutting his window with a bang dr mary walker who in her rather shabby man's attire was a familiar figure in those days was a particular abomination she made him creepy he said simply to mention her i found would dry up his talk but the mention of jonathan edwards name although he particularly detested him always loosened his tongue he was an inhuman cuss he said one morning there is a true story of his riding through northampton with a slave boy whom he had just bought tied to a cord and trotting behind the horse is thee doing as thee would be done by a woman of his faith called him and edward said i'll answer you some other time senator hoar rather enjoyed calling a man whose acts he disliked by hard names indeed he very much enjoyed salty words generally and one morning ably defended them damn it is a useful word it eases one's feelings he also put up a strong argument for whoppers they are he contended a valuable weapon with the impertinent and the imbecile there was much boyish mischief in him he greatly admired our wholesome big-hearted elizabeth daughter of the house her common sense and her gaiety and loved to pinch her plump arm he did it in the presence of us all and in spite of mrs hoar's reproaches do you know elizabeth he said one evening as he followed us up the stairs from the dining-room that it has taken nineteen years of christian civilization to produce a man who does not pinch a pretty girl's ankle when she is going upstairs ahead of him in july eighteen ninety eight after congress had adjourned senator hoar made up a party for a trip through the berkshire hills and i had the good fortune to be asked to join it i had heard him talk much of his walking trips there in harvard days with his favorite classmate francis child 
as great a man at seventeen when he entered college he said as when he died a real genius from the moment our little caravan left his home at worcester the trip was like champagne to him trees graveyards epitaphs views the homes of the honored in this day and past days kept him busy there was the sheffield elm where we must stop to measure the grave of mumbet with the inscription his favorite catherine sedgwick had written for it there was the best view of the sleeping napoleon on cedar mountain this for me then we must spend the night at a certain inn on mount washington to give elizabeth plenty of time to look up family graves and records her father had been born on mount washington which was one of many reasons why the senator admired her he went with her to look up the graves and returning late said if we had not feared you would wait supper we would have stayed and been buried there i have certainly never known any one for whom life at seventy was more joyous and full he hated weakness as well as everything that impaired his dignity his self-reliance he was a true untouchable and would fall into a rage if friend or stranger offered to assist him unhand me he thundered at a street-car conductor who one day seized his arm to help him up the steps and his wrath lasted until he had told us about the indignity at the dinner-table on this berkshire trip a little accident happened to him which caused an explosion of the same nature we were at an inn in the mountains and after dinner had gone to the lawn the senator was sitting on a rustic bench which gave way turned him on his back feet in the air we all ran to assist him but were stopped in our tracks by a stentorian voice which roared i decline to be assisted but this was the senator on a vacation the senator of our sunday morning's breakfast take him when public affairs were in a serious tangle and he was glum unapproachable he suffered deeply over the trend to imperialism after the spanish-american war to save cuba from the maladministration of spain to watch over her until she had learned to govern herself seemed to him a noble expression of americanism but to annex lands on the other side of the globe for commercial purposes only as he believed was to be false to all our ideals he had the early american conviction that minding one's own business was even more important abroad than at home he wanted no entangling alliances and in those days following the treaty of paris he feared as never before for the country certainly there were far fewer sunday morning breakfast-table talks his greatest speech against the advancing imperialism was made in april of nineteen hundred at the head of the printed copy of his speech distributed by the senate he placed these sentences no right under the constitution to hold subject states to every people belongs the right to establish its own government in its own way the united states cannot with honor by the title of a dispossessed tyrant or crush a republic i was learning something of what responsibility means for a man charged with public service of the clash of personalities of ambitions judgments ideals and it was not long before i was saying to myself as i had not for years you are a part of this democratic system they are trying to make work is it not your business to use your profession to serve it but how that was clearly now my problem i could not run away to a foreign land where i should be a mere spectator indeed i was beginning to suspect that one great attraction of france was that there i had no responsibility as a citizen i must give up paris between lincoln and the spanish-american war i realized i was taking on a citizenship i had practically resigned the war had done something to mcclure's as well as to me in all its earlier years its ambition had been to be a wholesome enlivening informing companion for readers to give fiction poetry science of wide popular appeal an ambition which it must be admitted opened the pages occasionally to the cheap though it rarely excluded the fine an eager welcome was given new writers indeed it was always a great day in the office when we thought a real one had reached us while it fostered new writers it held on to the best of the old 
it had touched public matters only as they became popular matters thus when the spanish-american war came it was quickly recognized that it yielded more interesting material than any other subject there was a great war number and there was a continuous flow of war articles mcclure's suddenly was part of active public life having tasted blood it could no longer be content with being merely attractive readable it was a citizen and wanted to do a citizen's part it had a staff sympathetic with this new conception of the work mr mcclure had had in mind from the start the building of a permanent staff of good craftsmen reporters on whom he could depend for a steady stream of contributions as well as of editorial ideas he wanted them versatile flexible as interested in the magazine as in themselves capable of sinking themselves in a collective effort after i came in the first to become such a permanent acquisition was ray stannard baker an article on the capture of john wilkes booth by baker's uncle colonel l c baker written from personal reminiscences and documents was submitted by baker then on the staff of the chicago record it was the general's ideal of a mcclure's article baker was urged to write more and each piece emphasized the first impression the year after his first appearance in the magazine may eighteen ninety seven he joined the staff and became a regular contributing editor baker was an admirable craftsman as well as a capital team worker he had curiosity appreciation a respect for facts you could not ruffle or antagonize him he took the sudden calls to go here when he was going there with equanimity he enjoyed the unconventional intimacies of the crowd the gaiety and excitement of belonging to what was more and more obviously a success he was the least talkative of us all observant rather than garrulous the best listener in the group save mr phillips he had a joyous laugh which was more revealing of his healthy inner self than anything else about him when i learned a few years later that baker was the author of the wise homely whimsical adventures in contentment the friendly road and other delightful essays under the nom de plume of david grayson i said at once how stupid of me not to have known it haven't i always known that baker is a david grayson few practical philosophers indeed have so lived their creed as ray stannard baker and none have had a more general recognition from the multitude of people in the country who like him believe in the fine art of simple living it is a comforting and beautiful thing to have had as a friend and co-worker over many years so rare a person as ray stannard baker by good fortune mcclure's in this period happened on a reader of real genius viola roseborough the only born reader i have ever known i found her in the office after one of my frequent jaunts after material it was as a talker that i first learned to admire and love her her judgments were unfettered her emotions strong and warm her expressions free glowing stirring and she loved to talk though only when she felt sympathy and understanding she loved to share books of which she read many particularly in the biographical field she wanted none but the best no imitation no mere fact-finding her eagerness to let no good thing slip her consciousness of the all too little time a human being has in this world to explore its riches made her rigid in her choice an unsleeping eagerness to find talent and give it a chance and secondarily she said to enrich the magazine made every day's work with the unsifted manuscripts an adventure if she found exceptional merit that was also suited to mcclure's she might weep with excitement and she stood to it till faith grew in those less sure of the untried it was when mcclure's was making a great hunt for a good serial that i saw her one morning bringing into the editorial sanctum booth tarkington's the gentleman from indiana tears celebrating the discovery as she cried here is a serial sent by god almighty for mcclure's magazine this woman of unusual intelligence loyalty and of truly spartan courage was a precious addition to the crowd 
ill health threatened blindness have never lowered her enthusiasm her ceaseless effort to find the best to give the best she is still doing it the most brilliant addition to the mcclure staff in my time was lincoln steffens he had made himself felt in the journalistic and political life of new york city by a fresh form of repertorial attack young handsome self-confident with a good academic background and two years of foreign life and observation stephen began his professional career unencumbered by journalistic shibboleths and with an immense curiosity as to what was going on about him he was soon puzzled and fascinated by the relations of police and politicians politicians and the law law and city officials city officials and business business and church education society the press apparently groups from each of these categories work together supporting one another an organization close compact loyal from fear or self-interest or both it was because of this organization steffens concluded that graft and vice and crime were established industries of the city attacks from outraged virtues had slowed up the system at intervals ever since the civil war but never permanently deranged it a few rascals might be exterminated but they were soon replaced the system had bred new rascals grown stronger and more cunning with time he set out to trace its pattern incredibly outspoken taking rascality for granted apparently never shocked or angry or violent never doubtful of himself only coolly determined to demonstrate to men and women of good will and honest purpose what they were up against and warn them that the only way they could hope to grapple with a close corporation devoted to what there was in it was by an equally solid corporation devoted to decent and honest government business law education religion first as a reporter and later as the city editor of the globe stephen stirred the town it was entirely in harmony with the McClure method of staff building that this able, fearless innocent should be marked for absorption. He was persuaded to take the editing of the magazine, now in its tenth year and steadily growing in popularity and influence. He was to be the great executive, the editorial head that would shift some of the burden from the shoulders of Mr. McClure and Mr. Phillips but the machine was running smoothly even if with little outward excitement stephens made a brave effort to adjust himself to the established order to learn the situation naturally he took mr mcclure's meteoric goings and comings his passionate and often despairing efforts to make his staff see what he did his cries that the magazine was stale dying more seriously than those of us who had been longer together he seems to have been bewildered by what went on in the excited staff meetings held whenever Mr. McClure came in from a foraging expedition. I had come to look on Mr. McClure's returns as the most genuinely creative moments of our magazine life. He was an extraordinary reporter. His sense of the meaning, the meat of a man or event, his vivid imagination, his necessity of discharging on the group at once, before they were cold, his observations, intuitions, ideas, experiences, made the gatherings on his return amazingly stimulating to me. Sifting, examining, verifying, following up were all necessary. Mr. McClure understood that and trusted John Phillips to see that it was done but he properly fought for his findings in his autobiography stephens credits me with a tact in our editorial scrimmages which i do not deserve it is true as he says that i was the friend of each and all but what i was chiefly interested in was seeing the magazine grow in delight and in usefulness i knew our excited discussions were really fertile they also were highly entertaining it was in this unsatisfied seeking by mr mcclure for more and more of contemporary life that lincoln stephen's chief contribution to it and to the political life of his period had its root mr mcclure's fixed conviction that great editing was not to be done in the office he finally applied to stephen's who was bravely struggling there to become the great editor he had been called to be 
you can't learn to edit a magazine in the office mr mcclure told him get out go anywhere everywhere see what is going on in the cities and states find out who are the men in the movements we ought to be reporting and so steph went for a month to the middle west mainly constantly reporting back to the office in mcclure fashion what he was finding he combed the universities in the newspaper offices he looked up politicians he searched for writers anything and everywhere which might possibly be grist to the greedy mill in new york one of the schemes on which he had been commissioned to check up was a series of articles on city and state governments almost at once he began to see larger and larger possibilities in the idea there should be two series he wrote the office descriptions of the actual government of four or five typical cities and of as many states humanized by studies of the men who ruled them or who were fighting the true rulers a meeting with young district attorney folk of st louis then in the thick of a fight to reform his town whetted his appetite if we take up the states he wrote i would prefer to wait for william allen white to write the articles the cities will be more in my line if i should be entrusted with the work i think i could make my name a few weeks later he was entrusted with the work the result was the shame of the cities which as he prophesied made his name End of chapter ten